Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. I'm your co-host, Rich Gear here as well. And uh, I see, Doug, you have a couple of books on the table here. Well, I, uh, I'm only going to talk about one. Oh, just and, one, huh? And that's uh, uh, this uh, new book release that I've got coming out uh, pretty soon. It's uh, called Dr. Hale's Home Remedy and Recipe Book. And this is a book that I, uh, many years ago, found in my grandmother's attic. And uh, it's intrigued me ever since. It's been a, a sort of a project of mine uh, to, to figure out, well, uh, I've uh, f uh, wanted to scan the whole thing and, uh, and maybe uh, publish it, but uh, it just didn't seem like it was possible to do so, uh, at least back 30 years ago. Well, because I, the, number of, the number of volumes you'd have to do back in the day had to be so much, and a book like this probably is a micro market. You know what I'm saying? Although you could be surprised, but you, you don't, especially when you're self-publishing. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So anyway, this book, uh, uh, from what I can, uh, I've actually read this uh, quite a number of times, and uh, this last uh, uh, last time, uh, what I'm uh, have done is transcribed these handwritten pages. Now the pages are. Uh, handwritten. It was uh, uh, written between 1844 and 1863. Yeah, so I was going to ask you. Those yeah. are the dates that are in this book. And so this is a, a doctor that lived uh, during the formation of uh, Michigan history. It's, it's really a, a, a good historical book. And really what it's telling me is that uh, this is the kind of uh, medicine, this is the kind of science that was to be done, done at the time of Darwin. And so, yeah, well, so yeah, that, that's, yeah. That's sort of the tie-in that I've got in uh, with, with our uh, show right now. I was wondering how you're going to tie that in. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> uh, it uh, gives us a, a picture of uh, uh, what life was like, and uh, it starts right out with uh, something that's kind of cute. Uh, it uh, there's a, on the very first uh, inside cover there is a uh, some handwriting. It says. Steal not this book, you little cusses, for if you do, you will hear of fusses. And it's kind of interesting because the double S's are those elongated uh, well, look like F's. F's, yeah. Look like F's, yeah, yeah. And so uh, it was, uh, and... I didn't know they were still doing it that late. I, wow, the, the, the elongated S was... Uh, you know, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, you, right. you, you see that. You can see you that know. quite a bit. Yeah. So that was a part of it. And uh, the other thing that I noticed with this book is that uh, it had all of these uh, strange symbols in it. And uh, there was a, uh, actually at the, on the very first uh, recipe on the bottom of the page was a, a A through Z code. Oh, so uh, you were able to figure out what the symbols mean and transcribe yes, them? Yes. Okay, I see. And so, uh, but the, the, there's the other symbols that, which I couldn't figure out at first. And then I uh, looked up uh, these weights and measures. So there, they were pounds, and then there was uh, ounces, okay, ounces, ounces, and then grams, and then <laughs> the scruples, and then the grains. And it oh, turns yeah. out uh, that uh, there uh, there was an old English apothecary system that they were using at the time, and each of those different um, weights and measures had their own little particular symbol. And so uh, the, the only problem is that the symbol for ounce and the symbol for dram are quite similar, and in the handwriting, I'm not sure if I've got oh, it right. Oh, well, you got the right one. Uh, so you so, took a chance, huh? But I've uh, pretty much uh, been able to figure out uh, most of the ingredients in, in this book. Uh, well, what is a dram? Uh, okay, uh, this is the way it works. You have 12 ounces in the old English apothecary system to make a pound. Okay. And so it's different than the 16, 16 ounces. 16 ounces, right, okay. And then you have uh, 96 drams to a pound. You have 288 scruples to a pound, then uh, then it's so it all it all goes into what a pound what equals a pound yeah it goes into it is? A, a, okay. it equals a pound now uh, it also has I think it was like 5,760 grains to a pound so they didn't like grains to a to a scruple to a dram to an ounce they didn't do that. You can probably figure it out, or did you? Yeah, you, you can figure it out, uh, and uh, and so you can uh, pretty much figure out how much uh, of each uh, works. And then, 
Then they had uh, different liquid measures. Uh, they had, of course, the cup and the gallon, and uh, but they had a, a gill, which is a half a cup. And, and so they, they used that in this book. But anyway, one of the things that I find interesting is that uh, uh, they used a lot of ingredients that were uh, fairly uh, poisonous, okay. Uh, the, on the uh, bottom of the uh, first page, which I'm showing here to you, Rich, and I'll show up well, on, we'll put it on, on the screen. screen. Yep. Uh, the bottom the code, uh, what he used was for some of the more esoteric ingredients. And, and uh, he didn't really want everybody to know what he was putting in his pills. And so there is an a, a ague pill on page number seven, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, ague was uh, malaria. And this is, is that what that is? Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, I know that like consumption is tuberculosis, right? Right. Ague yeah. is malaria. Okay, ague is malaria. I did not know that. But uh, was it has what that was. Uh, quinine is one of the ingredients. Yeah. And it has uh, 10 grains. And then you have uh, in code, uh, and I looked this up, it's arsenic. Uh, and then five grains of arsenic. And then uh, the next uh, th ingredient is uh, uh, opium. Wow. And so the, there's 15 grains of opium in this pill. Then it has African KN, and you mix them all into with a wedge, with a mortar, for, uh, for 15 minutes. And uh, it's very specific in what they have to do to uh, pulverize this into a pill. Well, I know that quinine, isn't quinine used to treat a malaria? Was quinine it? is used to treat malaria. So, uh, what are those other three ingredients? Do they do anything? Well, I, mean, the arse, I mean, is that arsenic enough to poison you? Or does it actually have a beneficial effect in low amounts? I mean, I don't know. Well, you've got five grains. And, and, the, and like I said, there's 5,760 grains to a pound. So it's a very minute amount. Yes, it is. A trace amount. Do you but, think, you know, uh, I wonder if it was effective? Uh, that's a good question because uh, uh, I, uh, I'm not about to try. I'm not about to try it either, but you were the first one that, woke, that, that got me uh, aware of the fact that some things that are real poisonous, you know, you hear the word uh, cyanide, for instance, right. and uh, you need trace amounts of that for your immune, or your, uh, isn't it an immune system or something? To, to, yeah, to, right. For the cell, cell structure to, to click on and off. It actually tr helps things turn on and off. Mm -hmm. But cyanide, you hear that, and it's like, oh my gosh, well, I was just wondering about the same thing with arsenic there, because those are the two, those are like the two deadly poisons you hear about in all the murder mysteries. That's you know, right, cyanide yeah. or arsenic, those are the two, yeah. you know, that, that are used to kill people. But uh, I'd be, yeah. I'd, that'd be fascinating, because some of those old remedies, Doug, I, you sometimes wonder, like the old adage, you know, what goes around comes around, you know? Yeah, right. Um, and you wonder if some of those old medicinal things might actually be efficacious, might actually work to some extent in modern things. We've gotten, we're so um, pill happy today, we're so conscious of, of, of basically modern medicinal uh, things that we uh, kind of ignore some of the old home remedies. Right. And um, interesting that here's a doctor mixing things up, but even so, doctors were, they were not treated that well at that early stage. Doctors were not, uh, they're not like today. They were not like the high priest to, of, of modern Yeah, they, they were the culture. snake oil. oil they people. were the snake oil guys. And they, and they had guys that they had, they had placebos and, and uh, all kinds of things that really didn't work at all, except that maybe they made you feel like you, it would work. And, and sometimes, quite frankly, Doug, they've learned that that actually does work. Yeah. Sometimes placebos are, are actually help. Yeah, so, look, look, listen to this. So there's uh, the one that's uh, crossed off here. It's good for itch, itch ointment. Yeah, but it says uh, sulfuric acid. Oh. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then oil of turpentine and uh, olive oil and mix them all together. It says it's infallible, but he's crossed it off. <laughs> so it must be fallible. Yeah, sul sulfuric acid. Oh, yeah, that'll get rid of your itch as long as it'll, it'll, it'll burn your skin off, you That's know? That's right. It's, and then right up above it, uh, he's got spruce beer. And so uh, he has uh, uh, water and molasses and ginger and, uh, uh, and allspice and yeast and hops and, uh, uh, and he, he mixed the ginger and allspice in the, in the, in the kettle. 
and then uh, add spruce to it and it uh, dissolves in the pail and uh, and then it's, uh, throw it on a uh, cask and then and then uh, stir it with, uh, you know, all from until fermentation. So you don't have to boil it or anything like that. You just yeah, let, let, let it raw. Let, let it, uh, go Ferments over. naturally, huh? Right. Yeah. So you have spruce beer and uh, and there's uh, another one here for uh, maybe somebody out in the audience would like to try that out. Yeah. <laughs> Mix it up. See if it tastes any good. Now, Doesn't sound good to me, but uh, this uh, cover here uh, is uh, basically the original cover that I scanned, and and mm -hmm. the uh, the book that I've uh, I'm going to be publishing. This was a one of a kind book that I uh, published with the uh, with just to uh, reproduce what it had in the beginning. Do you have your transcription in there, Doug, or is it just the original writings? Uh, this is the original writings in this particular uh, copy. Right. The transcription will be on facing pages in the right. new book. And I've got a new cover designed for it, and it looks like an old-timey book, uh, but it, uh, it's, um, it's going to be uh, a lot more professional looking. Okay. Uh, so this one, uh, I'm going to actually give uh, to a special person. I'll tell you a little bit about that right now. Uh, one of the things that I did when I was trying to figure out this book is um, I asked the question, well, who is this Dr. Hale? And uh, there's actually several different people mentioned in, in the book. There's Wallace A. Hale, uh, then there's Jerome Hale, Lucy Hale, Fanny Hale, and Benjamin F. Hale. And where do they hail from? Well, they hail from Michigan. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, from uh, Ann Arbor, and uh, it also talks about Cass County. Okay. And it also talked about Wakanda, Illinois, which is uh, uh, sort of a suburb of Chicago. Uh, but uh, they they lived in Niles for a while, and Ann Arbor for a while, and then uh, I did an internet search on these names. And yeah, because you found this book. Uh, where did you find it in your? Where, where did you get this yeah, book? My grandma's at it. Grandma, the, the house in Lewiston? Uh, 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 well, that's where I figured it came from. Because, oh, okay. Uh, because uh, I sort of pieced together where the other books came from. I got a whole collection of books that uh, came from the uh, 1800s. Uh, there's an original edition of Longfellow's Wayside Inn in the collection. Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah, and so there's uh, uh, quite a number of... Uh, uh, n nice old books uh, in that collection, but uh, this one, uh, this one was uh, unique, and then along with it, it was also a uh, old ledger from the uh, from a ghost town in northern Michigan called Summitville. And, okay. And that ha has a lot of drawings and pictures in it, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm probably going to work on that as well, you know, to make that available to people if they want it. Uh, actually. A lot of the stuff is available on our web website already, but <clears throat> this uh, this published book will actually reveal uh, what these ingredients are because uh, uh, in a lot of the cases uh, they were spelled the way they, they sounded, and in several cases, like for example, there is one that's called G O A C Wood. Goak, Goak, wood. G O A C wood. A that's, how, that's how he uh, spelled it. Well, I I was puzzled over that for uh, several uh, for a lot of uh, several weeks, and finally, what I figured out is it's the real spelling is G U I A I C uh, wood. And so it's I still a, it's don't a, know what that is. Oh, I don't know what it is either. Actually, I looked it up, and it is a, a medicinal plant. And so black wood, okay, black wood. So All right. And so that's they you know, just uh, spelled it the way they sounded. <laughs> well, that's fine, but it, it, it's like I was saying. Well, if guac, guac wood would maybe translate it into teak wood or 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 uh, maple wood or something, I would get it. But it's yeah. into something else that equally <laughs> equally unknown to me. So yeah, it, it's actually from it's South America. South America. So, okay. so how they uh, got it here and used it uh, multiple times and in the ingredients. That's a good question, you know. It tells me that uh, 
you know, there was a lot of training going on at the time. And uh, well, yeah, I mean, you figure even like we talk about Darwin. Darwin was down there in South America doing right. the Beagle. He was doing that whole that whole whole uh, trip down there on this off of the right. South that South American coast. On uh, what was that? Was the the Pacific side, wasn't it? Right. Yeah, Pacific side. He was, yeah, because he went to the Galapagos Islands and all those areas down there. Anyway, um, um, so I. Uh, looked up uh, these names on the internet and actually I found a uh, reference in a old uh, 1913 uh, history of Calhoun, Calhoun County and uh, there is a Walter Hale which is actually who is the brother of this Wallace Hale and uh, he was the son of Jerome and Lucy Hale and the grandson of uh, Benjamin F. Hale and so, uh, uh, who's the Dr. Hale who wrote the book? Wallace Hale. That's Wallace. I know. Well, actually, a lot of the recipes, uh, and, and actually more of the ones in the back, are from uh, Grandpa Benjamin F. Hale. And, okay. Uh, and they uh, was he, he a doctor as well? Yeah, he was a doctor, and he uh, died in the, like 1865. So, uh, yeah. uh, so he was uh, the Grandpa, and then the Wallace took over the. The family business, and he he actually was a a doctor in Ashley, Michigan. For from when I, okay. I ended up uh, tracking down from this. Uh, so you've actually found some of the descendants. I found the descendants. Now wow. uh, it talked about Walter Hale and his uh, son Frederick and his grandson Orville, and, uh, and uh, at that time in 1913, uh, Orville was uh, a, a youngster. And uh, I found Orville in the 1940 census, and in that census he has two kids. Uh, the, the first one is named Jerome, after uh, Jerome in this book. Okay. And then uh, the other one is named Truman. Well, Tr uh, Jerome had died uh, uh, about eight years old, but Truman had a phone number. Uh, and, and so I call him up, I say, hey, I think I got a piece of your family history here. And uh, you know, how, did you how did you find him, Doug? Uh, well, I uh, I looked, I did a search on Truman uh, on the internet. Internet search, okay. And, and so it, uh, um, and it, uh, so he's eighty years old. Okay. And and so I actually then found uh, he, he told told me that you know well you need to talk to my sister uh, Lois because she's the one who uh, actually is the family historian. Oh. Then I became friends with, on Facebook with uh, several of the yeah. her, her kids. Uh, 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 Truman's son Jeff uh, is a friend on Facebook, and then also uh, Lois's daughter Angie is a friend on Facebook. And I found out that Lois was in the hospital. I went up and visited her, and so she. Uh, and where where does she live? She lives in Mason. Wow, she's a practical neighbor here. You yeah. Know? So we, what we did was. Uh, uh, I took the original book here. Now, I, I took the uh, original book and I uh, actually donated it to the State of Michigan Archives. Okay. So if anyone wa actually wants to see this original book, uh, you can uh, make an appointment to the so State of So they accepted Michigan the book, Archives. huh? They accepted the book. Okay. And, and uh, some of the papers are also in the archives along with uh, my Uncle Elmer's uh, photographs. Wow. And so uh, there's a uh, Douglas Sharp collection at the archives that uh, you can peruse and take mm. a look at because there's a lot of uh, interesting things in it. So uh, the things I noticed here is that uh, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, they did back then which uh, we would consider dangerous. Like uh, there's a sure cure for hydrophobia. Now, uh, who knows what hydro hydrophobia is? The yeah, one getting bit by a dog? Yeah, the rabies. Rabies, yep. Okay. Yep. Well, uh, the cure for the hydrophobia is to uh, uh, clean out the wound and then uh, put a few drops of hydrochloric acid in it. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Holy smokes! I think that's the cure. Might be worse than worse than the disease, man. I don't know. Well, uh, uh, you don't want to get the uh, rabies, so that's sure. No, that's pretty bad. Yeah. The other thing I found very interesting is that there are uh, multiple recipes in here for uh, what I call purgatives. Oh. So they uh, uh, they really thought that making you throw up was a good thing. 
Okay. <clears throat> and but I did also I did also there. find a reference to the use of leeches uh, to uh, to do bloodletting. You know, it's funny you say that, Doug, because that's actually made a resurgence, believe it or not, to, to some extent. It's not common, I don't think. I've never seen any hospitals mm -hmm. around here, but I keep reading about people that are, they're actually, for certain things, are using leeches because they, they will sterilize a wound and clean out dead tissue uh, better than anything else they have. Isn't that something, Doug? That, yeah. So, but yeah, doctors, that's what they used to be called, was leeches. Yeah, you know? right. And of course, then they used to do things worse than that, because uh, leeches are, are actually pretty, they actually, they gross, they gross you out, but they actually kind of work. But bloodletting is a different deal. Mm -hmm. Blood, they killed, I think they killed Jack George Washington over there. Right, I think yeah. it's him or somebody they used to cut you open and try to ble bleed out the bad, the bad diseases, bad blood, you know, yeah. bad blood and all that kind of stuff. And that did, that's not really good at all. <clears throat> but, um, but leeches, on the other hand, if you have some kind of a poison or some kind of a, uh, like, Infection. Yeah. They'll put a leech on it, and it'll eat all the dead tissue and and suck all some of it. I know it's gross as you out, but then you got a wound that's totally sterile. Yeah, this is interesting here. And this is the uh, pomade for restoring the hair. And this was one of uh, Benjamin F. Hale's grandpa's. Oh, they're still working on that. Uh, and then <laughs> one of the, and the first ingredient is called pulverized cathodides. Now, uh, if you uh, know what that is, it's a tincture of flies. And what they do is that they take uh, Spanish flies and grind them up, and it's actually a hallucinogen if you uh, actually ingest it. Really? Yeah, but okay. there, it's pretty, uh, and uh, if you look it up on the in internet, uh, uh, some people uh, misuse it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a it's a drug that really is pretty nasty uh, and so but this is something that they actually uh, put in there this portion of what it is and um, and then they uh, I mean I used to hear Spanish fly was used as an aphrodisiac you know yeah, well, that's, that's what, it, what it was you know okay and, and, and so it's an aphrodisiac but it's not uh, not very good for it doesn't you. work very well I know I've heard, yeah. heard that when I was growing up years ago so uh, that was one thing, and then on the other side here, Conklin Sav, and then um, oh, uh, <laughs> oh, why? Uh, there was uh, something that was in code, and um, and it was uh, for an in injection in leucorrhea or gonorrhea, and uh, and to wash this this thing in code. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so uh, you get a little uh, idea of uh, uh, that they wanted to hide the uh, uh, the proper names for certain th the certain parts, parts of the anatomy. Yep. Okay. Yeah. There's uh, there was also back in the beginning there was a, uh, a pill for uh, uh, gonorrhea or the encode uh, was clap. The clap. Uh, okay. The clap. Yeah. And, and, and so, um, what I'm finding is that so this is this book is pretty eclectic. It goes anything from like like uh, formulas for like food to medicines to everything. I mean, yeah, it does, and even the color green, but the no oh, dyes, like, dyes, and okay. uh, but uh, also some pretty in, uh, interesting uh, good recipes for food. You know, and I, I kind of like this one. This one's actually going to be on the back cover. It's called Bird's Nest Pudding. Oh. And it says, if you wish to make what is called bird's nest pudding, prepare your custard, take ten, eight or ten pleasant apples, pare them and dig out the cores, but leave them whole, uh, set them in a pudding dish and pour your custard over them and bake them about 30 minutes. And so it's sort of like a, uh, a cobbler. Uh, yeah, it didn't sound bad. And uh, there's stuff for gingerbread, uh, cider cake, and then this is the real John Bud uh, Bull pudding. Uh, one pound of flour, one uh, ounce of uh, currants, uh, uh, then raisins and the beef suet, and uh, whites of eggs, and then nutmeg, uh, uh, grate it, uh, and uh, 
a teaspoon of full of ginger and sweet milk, and you beat the eggs and the. And what is this made then? It's called the real John Bull pudding. It's a pudding. It's a pudding, and and, and if it's John Bull, it's an English pudding. Yeah, sometimes those English has some real uh, blood puddings. You heard of those? And yeah. Ugh, that doesn't sound good at all. Well, this has got beef suet in it. Oh, that does not sound good to me. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and there's a lot of things here. There's whipped syllabub, and that's, uh, you have one quart of thick cream, one gill of wine, that's where we, uh, half a cup, uh, and the juice of two lemons, and the a uh, pound of loaf sugar, uh, and pour it into a large pan and then beat it well as the froth that rises to the top, take it off and put it in a glass. And so it's a, it's a drink. Okay. Uh, there's a recipe in here for ice cream. And ice cream can be made of all cream or of new milk, of a part cream or part milk, and a part each uh, uh, does well. To six quarts, add one and a half a pound of loaf or lump or good muscovada sugar, one third of an ounce of essence of lemon, or to suit your taste. To every uh, quart of the milk, add four eggs. Vanilla bean can be used. One uh, third of a bean is sufficient for six quarts. Uh, cut or uh, paste it, tie it up in a rag, boil it in a little bit of milk, prep it uh, through the uh, the rag and add, uh, add it to the rest of it. Turn the pail round and around the, the, the six, uh, as often as you can and scrape the uh, cream as it cools on the side of the pail uh, down to the center of the pail. Yeah, uh, Doug, you remember that about 20, 30 years ago? Yeah. Ice cream makers were all the rage. Yeah. I was not impressed. You know, all the work you had to do to make... To, uh, you know, ever do the crank ones? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It took forever. <laughs> then, Man, uh, well, that's what he's talking about here. You're not cranking it, but you're yeah. you're stirring it, you know. And it says, first saw a barrel and two and use the, for the outside vessel, then uh, fit a, a new tube to fill uh, the outside one uh, within three inches, put pounded charcoal on the bottom of the outside tub, fill all the, around the inside tub between and uh, then the outside one and that's put the ice on the bottom of the inside t tub and around the pail with a little salt and have to add the salt by littles and, uh, and that was an expression that they used quite a bit until uh, the, the cream is froze and it requires a, a quart of, or six quarts of pail full to freeze it and the tin pail must have uh, the cover made and uh, uh, nine inches across the top and nine and a half deep. So he gave the instructions how to actually make the apparatus to make the ice cream. So you're endlessly fascinated with this book, I can see, Doug. I, I yeah. am. It, it gives you a picture of what life was like uh, 150 years ago. And, you know, I, I find it uh, really fascinating. Um, and what I'm going to do with it, uh, uh, oh, here's a recipe for mead. For mead? Mead. What is mead? Is it like a beer, an ale? What is it? Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, alcoholic drink. And it says to make mead a wholesome, uh, pleasant drink, you have two quarts of water, two quarts of molasses, uh, f five ounces of tartaric acid, uh, five ounces of wintergreen essence, uh, one ounce of lemon, one ounce of sassafras, all mixed together and take the white of, of two eggs and beat it up in the spirits uh, and the brown sugar and add to the above syrup. Take the, two tablespoons of full of the syrup uh, and put a pint glass, two thirds full of water, foam with a, a label. <coughs> and that makes mead? That makes mead. I thought mead was like well, I guess I didn't know what it was, really. I know something, it seemed like something drank, drank it on Merry Old England under, under Robin Hood days. Yeah, that, that's what know? it was. And <coughs> there, there are uh, certain things like that uh, available today. And so, uh, I've I, I spent a lot of time uh, transcribing this book. I know it, you it gives you a, a, a picture of what life was like uh, 150 years ago, and I'm 
I'm glad to have it. So what are your takeaways from what life was like 150 years ago? This was, he said, this was really Darwin was 1833 and he was on the Beagle. 1859 was the origin of species. This is right in the middle of that period of time, 1844 to 1864, 1865, whatever. Yeah, basically um, what this indicates to me is that the, the doctors of that time were really still experimenting with stuff. Uh, they weren't uh, very sure about their science. Well, Doug, uh -huh. they still call it practicing medicine. Yeah, right. And they get it wrong sometimes, blatantly wrong, but I mean, they do the best they can with the knowledge they have, but they're still experimenting is what I would say, but mm -hmm. it was even much more loose back in those days. We didn't have a lot of the pill factories that we do today. Didn't have a lot of the right. standards that we have today. So was every doctor like on their own in a sense, or what? Well, that's basically it. And if you were a good doctor, you got a lot of customers. <laughs> well, if you're a bad one, the customers didn't come back because a lot of them died. Probably. Yeah, that's you know? right. Yeah. So, but uh, what I, it also tells me is that you know th this is the life of uh, several different people. It uh, really meant a lot to the, this per particular person uh, to uh, have have all these things written down. And uh, to actually uh, s steal this uh, would have been a, a major blow to that family. Oh, I should say that was their record of all their formulas of everything. Yeah. Now it turns out that uh, the lady that lives in, the, in the Mason, she actually has another book that's like this, oh. and, and it actually mentions it in this book. It says on page 16, it says. Uh, as, uh, there's a, um, uh, a formula for a menagogue, which... Uh, Would you say menagogue? A menagogue, yeah. Whatever that is. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it actually uh, is used to produce abortion. Oh, okay. But uh, he says, he's, he, I have got this in my large book, Wallace, and it also mentions that book uh, another place, and I forget where it was. Maybe that book needs to be transcribed. It could be. I, uh, I, I don't know if I, I'm going to do it though. <laughs> so this is a lot of work. Yeah, well, I, I know you, you put in. You put in months on this thing, Doug. Now the uh, then the kicker is the question is why did we have it in our collection? And uh, like I said, I traced this back to my uh, this Lewiston uh, place that we have up north and. In Michigan, and it, that belonged to my great great uncle, my grandmother's this uncle. This book, uh, well, uh, that uh, house and oh, the house, okay, and and so this was amongst the collection of books, and so I I asked, well, how did Uncle Elmer Thompson uh, get a hold of this book, and um, how how did it end up in our collection, and I puzzled over that for a while. And then until I found this reference, uh, and uh, and he was actually actually had a farm in, uh, in Calhoun County, now down by Albion. Okay, so south. So south. But you, this, so but you say that you, they say this was up at Lewiston at right. some point. So got to get from. And so he, uh, Lewiston was his vacation property. Okay, all right. And so he actually owned quite a bit, for, did a few different camps and vacation properties. And so then I said, well, most likely what happened was that uh, Uncle Elmer borrowed this book from uh, Frederick or Orville or one of the relatives and never returned it. <laughs> well, that's, that's a state of books, I would say. I've loaned a lot of books out myself and never saw them come back. Yep. And so and you have two probably. So you know? now, uh, now uh, what this does for me is that it brings it full circle. Uh, now the, uh, the the Hale family, the descendants of the Hale family, will get a chance to uh, get a copy. Uh, and sure. And I'm going to probably send this one to uh, Lois, and uh, because this is most likely the like the original book. Right. And uh, then uh, they'll have uh, a, a new one available, which will be twice as big because I uh, I have on the facing page the. The original uh, and the, the transcript. You see the original like writings. He cleaned it up so you could actually sort of read it, but then you have it tri typed out in, in legible modern print, right? Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, time that we uh, we have with this. Uh, order this book. Uh, you can find it on uh, our website rae.org, and we'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.